presentation. So I'll start by talking about the protein itself, its structure, function, and the genetics of disease. Then moving into epidemiology, the clinical features of alpha-1 antitrypsin disease, how to diagnose it, and then how to treat it. So I'll start by just introducing a couple cases. As you mentioned, Dr. Diaz, this is something that, that maybe we don't see a lot of um, at Henry Ford, or maybe we are seeing a lot of it and it's just not being diagnosed. I actually, uh, earlier in the week, took an informal poll of my fellow first year uh, pulmonary fellows. And between all of us, actually none reported that we had any patients in our clinic that we were following with alpha-1 antitrypsin disease. So I think by introducing a couple cases, it may be a little bit easier to apply it if we think about these two patients throughout the presentation. So patient A is a 35-year-old male. He's a new consult for dyspnea. He's been smoking about a pack a day since he was age 20 and has basilar predominant emphysema. He has obstruction on his PFTs and an FEV1 40% of predicted. So this is obviously a very kind of classic patient who would have alpha-1 antitrypsin. It would certainly be on our radar seeing this patient in clinic. Um, but keep in mind sort of your thought process about how to go about diagnosing this patient, what treatment options would you consider discussing with him, and what other things uh, may you be looking for in his history or physical as far as associated issues with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. And then patient B is a little bit more typical of a COPD patient, someone that's probably on everybody's schedule almost every week in the pulmonary clinic, a patient in their mid 50s, who again is a new consult for dyspnea. This patient has a greater than 30 pack year smoking history, a typical upper lobe predominant emphysema, and obstruction on PFTs with an FEV1 40% of predicted. So if you're seeing this patient on a routine basis in the clinic, I guess one thing to think about is would alpha-1 antitrypsin even cross your mind or be on your radar? And is it something that you would consider testing this patient for? Or if you tested him and he was positive for alpha-1 antitrypsin, would it even make a difference in his management plan? So keep these two cases in mind as I go throughout the, the remainder of the presentation. So what is alpha-1 antitrypsin? This is a 394 amino acid glycoprotein. It's synthesized and secreted by the liver. It is an antiprotease or protease inhibitor that's main job is to protect the lungs from neutrophil elastase. Um, and this goes back to the protease antiprotease theory of emphysema patho pathogenesis. So in a normal patient with normal alpha-1 antitrypsin levels, there's a significant excess of alpha-1 antitrypsin that is able to protect the lungs from disease caused by proteases like neutrophil elastase. But in patients with disease, this balance gets skewed and there's sort of an unchecked ability of these proteases to damage the lungs and cause emphysema. For example, so what I'll be talking about today is predominantly the congenital alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, but I want you to keep in mind that there is also a functional alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency every time somebody smokes. So when a patient uses tobacco, the smoke inhalation and tobacco inhalation causes reactive oxygen species and free radicals. This leads to an inactivation of antiproteases like alpha-1 antitrypsin, and it also causes an inflammatory response recruiting neutrophils, which causes a local increase in neutrophil elastase, and this combination of imbalance between alpha-1 antitrypsin and neutrophil elastase leads to tissue damage. So you can imagine how accelerated this process can be if the patient already starts with a congenital alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, but on top of that, they smoke and cause a functional deficiency as well. This alpha-1 antitrypsin protein, again, it's this very complicated glycoprotein. It does need to be perfectly arranged in order to both be secreted by the liver and to do its job of attacking neutrophil elastase. The normal protein form or structure is the M form. And so as you'll see kind of listed in, in papers or up to date that the normal genotype is listed as PI, which stands for protease inhibitor, MM, meaning that the patient has two normal alleles or two normal um, genes for coding of the protein. This protein is inherited in an autosomal co-dominant fashion. So in general, as long as a patient has at least one normal or M allele, 
they're fairly well protected from disease. So it almost behaves as a, an autosomal recessive disease where they need to inherit two abnormal genes to have issues. The most common abnormal gene in alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency is the Z form. So these patients have the PIZZ genotype, and this is present in 98% of people with severe alpha-1 antitrypsin disease. And the reason for this abnormal gene or protein causing disease is that it misfolds and polymerizes. When it misfolds and polymerizes, it gets trapped in the liver and causes local damage to the liver because it can't be secreted into the bloodstream. And then also because there's a deficiency in the bloodstream, there's a deficiency in the lung, which leads to this unchecked ability of neutrophil elastase to cause emphysema. And even if there is a little bit of protein that is secreted by the liver, it tends to be dysfunctional and not protective of disease if you have the Z form. This slide I'm gonna go back to a little bit later, but there's just a couple things that I wanna highlight on it. It looks at a couple different genotypes on the far left, the risk for emphysema in the middle column, and then what their standard plasma levels are. But it's just really to introduce the fact that there are several different genotypes, although the ZZ is far and away the most common, uh, disease causing one, that there are more than 100 different alleles of alpha-1 antitrypsin. The MM, as I mentioned, is the most common. These people, people tend to have serum levels of 80 to 220, and they're at no increased risk of emphysema. Patients with the abnormal ZZ combination are at very high risk of emphysema, and their plasma levels tend to be about 20 to 45. And I did also want to introduce the concept on this slide of the protective threshold. So in studying patients with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, they found that as long as a patient has a serum level in excess of 57 milligrams per deciliter, they tend to be protected from disease. So I'll talk a little bit later about some of these intermediate genotypes and why for the most part they don't experience any issues. Now moving on to the epidemiology of the condition, I think that th this is a very short section of the presentation, but I, what I want you to gather from it is that this disease is far more common than we give it credit for, as Dr. Diaz alluded to earlier. So the estimated prevalence of this condition in the United States is around 70 to 100,000. It's estimated that approximately less than 10% and maybe even far lower than 10% of those have actually been diagnosed. Looking at data from seven other countries, this is a table from a, a previous study that on the left side of the table looks at the amount of patients that would be expected to have alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency based on allele frequencies in the population. And on the right side of the column, how many of those have actually been diagnosed based on registry data? Now, obviously, there are some reasons why you know, maybe the patient hasn't um, had their information passed on or enrolled in the registry, but this does give an overall sort of a good estimate of how many patients are being diagnosed. And in total, of these more than 300,000 expected cases, approximately 1,000 have been diagnosed, representing around a 0.3% diagnosis rate of what we would expect. Furthermore, the estimated worldwide number of cases is approximately 3.4 million, and it's expected that there are 116 million carriers. So this is actually one of the most common severe hereditary disorders. Um, worldwide, this would be more common than cystic fibrosis even, and if we look at the estimated prevalence in the United States, if we were to diagnose all these cases, it would be about equivalent to sickle cell disease. And just another way to look at this is approximately two to 3% of our patients with COPD probably have alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. So for every you know, 30 to 50 patients you're seeing in clinic as a COPD consult, probably one of those has alpha-1. Now moving on to the clinical features of the disease. So I'll, I'll mainly focus on lung disease. Liver disease is also gonna be very important as well. And then the last two are just associations to be aware of, predominantly I would say for uh, board question associations. So as far as the pulmonary manifestations go, this would be a very typical alpha-1 patient. He's fairly young, he's 49 with severe dyspnea, it has some smoking history, but not all that significant, about 10 pack years and has a family history of emphysema. And the one thing that I wanna point out on this slide is the distribution of his emphysema. So looking at that CT slice on the left, capturing the upper lung fields, there's, there's really little to, to kind of no emphysema on that scan. 
but looking over at the right, this patient just has very extensive bibasilar, panlobular emphysema. That would be your classic alpha-1 phenotype. So again, the classic, classic phenotype is the early onset basilar pan, panlobular emphysema. But one thing that's really important is that we don't anchor on that phenotype because what's happened over time is that this has become a self-propagating phenotype, meaning that when we're only thinking about alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency in a patient who presents like this, then our whole population of alpha-1 patients are really going to have this exact same phenotype. Uh, you know, it needs to be on our radar for other patients who aren't presenting so classically. So in reality, actually, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency uh, has a variable age of presentation. Patients may present from asymptomatic to severely symptomatic at the time of initial presentation. They may have multiple different phenotypes of pulmonary disease like COPD, asthma, or even bronchiectasis. And they can have variable radio radiographic distribution, so not just that bivasilar um, emphysema, actually a third of them or so have an apical predominance of their lung disease. The natural course of pulmonary disease once patients develop it. So the way to think about it, I guess, is that smokers with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency are going to present about 20 to 30 years earlier with, you know, shortness of breath and emphysema than your typical COPD or so at between, you know, age 30 to 40 as opposed to, um, you know, 50s, 60s. 90% of those with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency who smoke will get emphysema, as well as approximately two-thirds of non-smokers. But again, there is significant heterogeneity in the lung disease itself. And even in two patients who have equivalent serum levels, they may have vastly different presenting symptoms, um, imaging features, and PFTs. In general, uh, patients with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, once they have pulmonary disease, they probably progress a little bit faster than our usual COPD patients. And then it is also important to keep in mind that there are this subset of alpha-1 patients who are considered rapid decliners, where they show pretty significant and quick decline in their FEV1. Liver disease is very common as well, and something that we really need to keep in mind when seeing these patients. Again, as I mentioned earlier, it's a result of this misfolding and polymerization that causes a direct injury to hepatocytes. The liver disease can start very early in life with neonatal hepatitis and cholestasis, and can also have you know, extensive complications in adulthood like cirrhosis, chronic hepatitis, and even hepatocellular carcinoma. So a patient with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, if they have severe complications or even die from their disease, it is generally due to the liver condition itself, especially if they, they have these issues under the age of 30. And then patients with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency who live to greater than 50 years old, around a third of them or so are going to have one of these significant uh, hepatic complications. And then also when we look at non-smokers with alpha-1, the, the liver disease is going to be a significant cause of complications and death since they're a little bit less at risk for the pulmonary complications. Two other associations, as I mentioned, to keep in mind are going to be paniculitis and an association with GPA, though these are fairly uncommon, though more so um, something you may see on boards. So paniculitis, a couple of pictures of it on the right side there, but these are inflammatory lesions of the skin and subcutaneous tissue that cause hot, painful, and red nodules. They generally occur on the thigh or the buttocks, and they do cause uh, what's described as this oily discharge from them. The mean age of onset is around 40 years, and even though this is reported as a pretty consistent association with alpha-1, it actually occurs at less than one case uh, per thousand with alpha-1 antitrypsin disease. So, so it's very rare even in the setting of alpha-1. Treatment options include dapsone and doxycycline, um, and then also augmentation therapy, which I'll talk about a little bit later. It's essentially giving the patient back alpha-1 um, protein, but it's been very successful in the treatment of paniculitis. So that's something to keep in mind as well. The association with GPA, so in patients that have been studied with GPA compared to patients without GPA, the odds ratio for having an alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency genotype is 14. So it is more common to have alpha-1 in a patient who has GPA. 
And the pathogenic association is that in the absence of alpha-1 alpha one antitrypsin, there's unchecked proteinase 3. So given the higher levels of proteinase 3, there's a higher likelihood of an autoimmune response from your anti-PR3 or c anca proteins. Now moving on to the diagnosis of alpha-1 antitrypsin. So the first step in diagnosis is to look at a quantitative serum level. Uh, in general, normal is considered to be between 100 and 220. And just for reference, in our lab, it's reported as 90 to 100. So anything under 90 will flag as abnormal. It's recommended that if a patient's level is under 100 milligrams per deciliter, that they should have genotyping to verify what their genotype is. But keep in mind that, so this is gonna catch uh, by far the majority and, and pretty well all of our patients with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency if we use a cutoff of 100, but it's also gonna catch a lot of patients who have a slightly low, um, low level that's not really gonna cause any disease. And keeping in mind their protective threshold is around 57. So you're gonna catch a lot of patients, even normal ones whose level's less than 100, but they may have the normal MM genotype. And that's highlighted here again, the, the normal patients with MM have a, a standard plasma level around 80 to 220. So some of them may be flagged as abnormal. And looking down at the very common ZZ one, the, almost all of those patients have levels less than the protective threshold. As I mentioned, there are a couple of these different intermediate phenotypes. They're important because these patients are carriers of disease, so they can pass them down to future generations. And then in particular, the SZ phenotype there with a the star next to it, there's report that it may have some mild increase in the risk of emphysema. Though generally, if these patients with uh, intermediate phenotypes, if they don't smoke, they have little to no risk of having any ramifications of that um, gene abnormality. You should also be aware of the null genotype. This patient makes no alpha-1 antitrypsin protein whatsoever. So 100% of these patients will develop emphysema by the time they're 30 years old. They have an undetectable plasma level of alpha-1. And because of this, they can't develop any liver disease from their condition because there's none of that protein available to misfold and polymerize and cause any issues. One thing to be aware of, uh, maybe worth mentioning to patients who might want to get tested for this, is that there is uh, the availability of free testing through the Alpha One Foundation for patients who want it. They will send you out a free finger stick test, which checks the serum level as well as the genotype. Um, the website is listed below there at the Alpha One Foundation, and this all goes through the University of Florida and is used for their registry and research data. So if patients have any concerns about things like um, cost of the lab test or even privacy of knowing results, this may be an option for them. It's all confidential and they can do it right at home. So the diagnostic, actually, uh, you know, the results of the testing for the patients aren't all that complicated, but really the more challenging thing is who to test. Um, and how well we're doing this. This is certainly board testable. So the GOLD initiative for COPD recommends that all patients with a diagnosis of COPD should be screened at least once in their lifetime. Um, I could certainly see there being a question on boards where the, you have a very typical COPD patient and they give you a list of diseases that seem fairly uncommon and are asking which ones they should be routinely tested for and alpha one would certainly be the one to pick there. We also have guidance from this, uh, from the ATS and European Respiratory Society. Their most recently updated guidelines are from 2003. The European Respiratory Society has an update from 2017 that's available, um, though the ATS one is from 2003. So level A recommendations to test, which per this document state that all of these patients should be tested. And those are symptomatic adults with emphysema, COPD, or asthma that's incompletely reversible with aggressive bronchodilators. Then there's patients with unexplained liver disease who should be tested. Um, as I'm sure you've all seen, patients who are getting a liver transplant evaluation, this is always one of the things that gets tested for. 
Patients who are asymptomatic but have persistent obstruction on PFTs and uh, identifiable risk factors should be tested. And then anyone with necrotizing paniculitis should be tested for alpha-1, not necessarily because it's all that commonly associated with alpha-1, but one thing to consider is that augmentation therapy is actually very effective for this, so it may be a consideration. Level B recommendations, the way that they um, describe this in the document is that clinicians need to at least be aware of this and, and have an open discussion with their patients about whether or not they should be tested. We kind of have a duty to inform patients about the option for testing in this scenario. And these are patients with bronchiectasis without an evident etiology, adolescents with persistent airflow obstruction, asymptomatic patients with persistent airflow obstruction and no risk factors, as well as any patient with C. vasculitis. I'm sorry, I know that was a lot of kind of some busy slides. So here's just to summarize which patients we should at least consider testing and in most cases should test. So emphysema, COPD, or asthma with incomplete reversibility on PFTs, anyone with persistent obstruction on PFTs, unexplained liver disease or bronchiectasis, and the associated conditions of paniculitis and C. vasculitis. So what's the importance of establishing a diagnosis in these patients? Number one would be the need to test family members as well. This is certainly something to consider. So if we looked at the diseased patient in the blue square there with the PIZZ genotype, if that patient was able to, um, to inherit two disease alleles from their parents, there's no reason why their siblings could not also have alpha-1 antitrypsin disease or at least be a carrier. It's also important to check that patient's partner. If the partner has normal MM genotype, then there's pretty well no risk um, to their offspring to having alpha-1 antitrypsin disease. So that would be something important to know as well. And then again, if, they are, if the partner is a carrier or the partner's disease, you would certainly check the children. Other things that are important and why we should establish this diagnosis is the opportunity to favorably affect smoking behavior. As I'll talk about in a couple slides from now, um, previous studies on neonatal screening of alpha-1 have shown that when patients carry a diagnosis in childhood, they are far less likely to ever start smoking or if they do start smoking later on to quit. The opportunity for counseling regarding hazardous careers, like the things we typically see that can lead to emphysema, certain manufacturing work or mining or tunneling and other things like that. The opportunity to at least consider a specific therapy for alpha-1 antitrypsin disease, which I'll talk about in the last section of this presentation. A better understanding of their disease course, so knowing that very often they may have a little faster progression than the typical COPD patient, and then also to consider other organ involvement like liver disease that may be overlooked in our usual COPD patients. And then in general, just enhancing our understanding as a medical community and patient community of the disease. As you'll see when I talk about the treatments, the, the data surrounding alpha-1 antitrypsin is very, very limited, generally retrospective data, and quite often really small patient numbers. So by you know, incorporating a little bit more widespread testing, I think that we can better understand how this disease affects our patients and, and maybe consider um, how trials for treatments could improve as a result of that. So this is the last section of the talk focusing on treatment of alpha-1 antitrypsin disease. The areas that I'll cover will be smoking cessation, although this is really more so you know, primary or secondary prevention. It is important to talk about in this population. The medical management of their COPD, the unique circumstances of lung volume reduction in this population, lung transplant, and then I'll, I'll finish off the presentation talking about augmentation therapy, which is our only specific treatment for the actual genetic deficiency in this disease. So starting with smoking cessation, again, as I mentioned, detecting alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency can favorably discourage smoking behaviors. And it's important for patients to know that in smokers who can't stop smoking, who have this disease, their life expectancy across the board is pretty well less than 20 years after this diagnosis. So a really important and kind of striking statement for them to be aware of. 
Um, the, the preferred approach to smoking cessation is combined behavioral and pharmacologic therapy, and first-line agents include nicotine replacement, varenicline or Chantix, and bupropion. I know that in many cases there are concerns about you know, cost of these medications, specific side effects or intolerances of the medications, but I think that in this patient population, we really have to consider the unique circumstances of the risk versus benefit um, in this population. They are, they are far more likely to benefit than a typical, say, 30-year-old who doesn't have alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency who smokes. This is really going to be um, life-threatening sooner than later for them. And then also another thing to consider is that studies on treatment of alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency is limited to non-smokers. So we don't really know how any of these things work in the population that continues to smoke. Obviously certain advanced therapies or lung transplantation, um, they may not qualify because of their smoking status. So medical management of COPD, I'm, I'm really not gonna talk about because it is essentially the same as our usual COPD patients as far as the inhalers go, you know, oxygen criteria, uh, fluid pneumococcal vaccines, pulmonary rehab, just our usual good COPD management um, is what we use in these patients. The only medical part that differs is augmentation therapy, which I'll talk about at the end. There are special circumstances to consider for lung volume reduction in these patients. So lung volume reduction surgery has been studied and it, it's shown that ben the benefits are inferior and sort of less long lasting than in our usual COPD patients. And there have been some data to show increased mortality versus medical management in alpha-1 patients. So in general, this is not used. More commonly, we're seeing BLVR used in typical COPD emphysema patients. It has not really been well studied in patients with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. It's been shown to be safe and effective in very, very small case series. So it's something that could be considered in carefully selected patients. However, uh, we have to keep in mind that the classic alpha-1 patient, which, which does make up the majority of this population, who has bibasilar emphysema is gonna be a very poor candidate. And this may actually lead to increased mortality. We usually want a good um, upper lung field target um, for BLVR. Lung transplant is another consideration for patients with end-stage disease. So this is the International Society of Heart and Lung Transplant data from 1995 to 2018, looking at the number of transplants done and what diagnosis they were done for. And alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency ranks fifth, accounting for close to 5% of lung transplants. Again, the data for lung transplant in the alpha-1 population, like most other things in this population, it is fairly limited, though it's certainly considered to be a viable option of, uh, for treatment in this disease, and it's fairly commonly done. There are two studies that have looked at this. These are really the biggest ones. They're both retrospective, um, and as you can see, fairly small patient cases. So in the, the STONE study there from 2016, looking at UK registry data, they compared 32 alpha-1 antitrypsin deficient patients who received transplant versus 48 who didn't. There was a higher median survival in those patients uh, who received transplant compared to those who didn't, though it was very underpowered and hard to reach statistical significance. And there were a lot of um, concerns about the, the study design overall, given that six of those 32 patients who received transplant actually died in the first 90 days and they were excluded from the, the final analysis. The Tanash study in the Journal of Heart and Lung Transplant, this looked at Swedish registry data, about double the size of, of the other study on this and showed a significant benefit in overall median survival. So I think that these numbers are, are fairly limited, though it is definitely a consideration for patients. We may just not have great data, but it's definitely a consideration for end-stage disease. There's more data looking at alpha-1 antitrypsin deficient patients with COPD who get transplant compared to usual patients with COPD to get transplant, and the outcomes are actually fairly equivalent. Um, there was even a study that I, that I looked at today that was from the past month that showed that there may even be um, improved outcomes in the alpha-1 antitrypsin population, so um, definitely a consideration for these patients. The indications for lung transplant in alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency are the same for all of our patients with COPD. 
So definitely one thing to keep in mind is they really do need a comprehensive evaluation for coexisting liver disease. Liver disease is very common in these patients, even in the absence of abnormal LFTs or abnormal imaging. Some centers have done routine biopsy on these patients and have shown that a significant amount of them already have some degree of fibrosis. So um, definitely something to consider that, that we need a full evaluation of their potential liver disease, whether it's apparent or not. So last but not least, I'll talk about augmentation therapy. This is the only specific and disease targeted therapy for alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency and it's pooled human plasma derived alpha-1 antitrypsin protein. There's four drugs approved in the United States. The one that I've highlighted there, prolastin C, that's generally the more common one used. It has the longest track record. It's been used since the late 80s. All of these medications are given intravenously and their dosing is once weekly. They've all shown that they're fairly safe, they're well tolerated, and they've all shown biochemical efficacy, meaning that they have shown that they are effective in inhibiting neutrophil elastase, and also shown that they can get a patient's serum levels above that protective threshold. But where there's a lot of controversy about augmentation therapy is whether or not they are truly clinically efficacious. So I'll start by, by going over what the guideline recommendation is regarding augmentation therapy, and then go back and look at a couple of the studies that got us to these guidelines. So the 2003 updates from the American Thoracic Society and European Respiratory Society recommend augmentation therapy for patients with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency who have established airflow obstruction. They say that there is a stronger evidence for benefit in patients with moderate airflow obstruction. So an FEV1 of 30 to 65% of predicted, though the benefits are much less clear otherwise. And it's only for patients with demonstrated emphysema. So not for those without emphysema. And one thing to recognize, and they report this in the guideline, is that supporting evidence for this comes pretty well purely from observational studies and I'll show you why moving forward here. So these are the randomized controlled trials on augmentation therapy. Sorry, this slide is a little bit busy, but I'll, I'll kind of highlight the three trials and, and some of the outcomes moving through them. So again, these are the three major trials looking at, um, or three only trials really, that are randomized controlled versus placebo of alpha-1 antitrypsin. They all used alpha-1 antitrypsin IV um, once a week. The primary outcome, so all studies looked at progression of emphysema by CT densitometry. In two of these studies, it was the primary outcome, and in one of them, FEV, change in FEV1 or FEV1 decline was the primary outcome. If we combine all of these studies together, done over almost a 20-year period, the total number of subjects is 315, and the duration of treatment was somewhere around two to three years or longer, depending on the trial. So the effect of treatment overall when taken into meta-analysis um, shows that it does probably reduce the rate of emphysema by CT densitometry. However, there's really no difference in clinically relevant outcomes. There's been no benefit in mortality, exacerbations, hospitalization, quality of life that's been demonstrated. Um, by any of these randomized controlled trials and their primary outcomes did not look at any meaningful clinical outcomes. So based on the Cochrane Systematic Review in 2016, they, they report that augmentation therapy cannot be recommended based on review of this data. Where the data for the recommendation really comes from is from previous observational studies. Um, four of these are observational. The, the Dirksen study in 1999 there with the stars next to it, that was just one of the, the RCTs that is lumped in with it at the timing of, of this meta-analysis. But the major study here is the Alpha-1 Antitrypsin Disease Registry in 1998. They retrospectively, they look back at uh, 581 patients who received augmentation therapy compared to 317 patients who were in the control group. When all five of these studies are taken together, there's 924 who received augmentation compared to 681 controls. And the primary outcome that they looked at was a change in FEV1 over time. 
sorry, just real quickly here, my, my arrows are out of order, I apologize. But in the alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency registry group, the relative risk of mortality was 0.64, and that was statistically significant. So based on this observational study, they report a mortality benefit. And overall, when taken together, these studies did show a slower rate of decline in FEV1 over time with a positive confidence interval. But the reason why they report that the best and really only evidence is for those with moderate obstruction is that when they looked at all of these patients in this review together, they found that only the patients in that moderate obstruction group actually had a slower rate of change of FEV1 over time um, with a positive confidence interval. The patient with severe obstruction, there was no statistical significance. And likewise, the patients without obstruction, you can see there's a really wide interval there um, and there was overall no benefit. So in this meta-analysis, which is consistent with the current recommendations by the ATS and ERS, augmentation therapy is felt to slow um, lung function decline when taken as a whole in patients with alpha-1 antitrypsin disease, though those with moderate obstruction are most likely to benefit. So just wrapping up by going back to our cases, I hope that for patient A, I've provided you a little bit of information about other things we need to look for in this patient as far as other systems that may be involved, other questions you may wanna ask them, um, and other testing that may need to be done, as well as how to go about diagnosing this condition and how to treat it. And then for patient B, at least having alpha-1 antitrypsin on your radar, um, and potentially at least testing them to, to follow through on the gold COPD guidelines as well as the ATS recommendations. Thank you all for your time and attention on this presentation. And I do also wanna thank Dr. Thavaraja who helped me prepare this presentation. Thank you very much, Mike. That was really, that was really good. Um, I am unmuting right now, everybody. I, I have a question, Mike. Yes. Regarding, um, so based on the uh, data that you presented and well, the limited data that we have overall in, in, in this uh, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, um, is there, uh, um, has there been, I don't know if there has been any study, studies or case series uh, uh, in, in terms of uh, um, uh, the augmentation therapy sort of like delaying the uh, other uh, kind of therapies like lung transplantation, for example, or even uh, lung volume reduction, uh, either bronchoscopic or, or surgically? So that, that's a really good question. You know, I'm not aware of any reports that, that shows the timing of correlation between like administering augmentation therapy and delaying advanced procedures or um, invasive treatments like BLVR or, um, or transplant. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so yeah, well, where it's shown benefit again, it's 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 very limited and it's all observational. Right. Yeah, and that's that's the problem. I think I, I think it is important, you know, to 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 mention here what Mike has already uh, mentioned through the entire presentation, and is that th there is definitely in more cases with alpha one antitrypsin deficiency that we think about uh, and probably a lot of our patients uh, already have it but never been tested so I think that's that's important to, to, to keep in mind yeah. uh, uh, also um, uh, of course unfortunately this is a disease that seems like once you have it really not much can do uh, except for genetic testing and try to uh, prevention or prevention with uh, uh, trying to uh, find it on the family or on the offsprings etc but the augmentation therapy, even though provides some sort of uh, or delays the progression, maybe up to two or three years uh, with some uh, changes on the FEV1, not necessarily is going to show much more in terms of other outcomes like survival or even quality of life. Is that right? Agreed. Yeah, there's there's really no data to to support that in a, a randomized controlled fashion proving benefit. And one thing that I should have mentioned during the presentation is is those who are I guess you know experts in alpha one antitrypsin who 
strongly recommend augmentation therapy and who you know challenge the belief that it's not helpful one of their concerns is that you know it's really difficult to recruit these patients to a trial because there's just not enough of them um, so all of these trials are underpowered there's also issues with cost um, the medication is about a hundred thousand dollars per year so wow. certainly not cheap yeah and also you know follow-up durations of the studies have been fairly limited and then there, there are also ethical concerns as well, because if you have a patient with alpha one in your clinic, you know, it'd be tough to explain to them that, hey, why don't we enroll you in a trial where you may get a placebo as opposed to the only thing that, that we know may specifically target this disease. So that becomes a challenge as well. Right. And that's, that's pretty much the problem uh, with uh, these rare or uncommon conditions in general. There is a, a Dr. Debian who would like to ask a question. Go ahead, Dr. Debian. You have the, you can unmute hi, Mike. yourself. Uh, yeah, hi, thank you. Thank you for your presentation. I really enjoyed it. My um, question to you was in that meta-analysis of observational studies where they showed that for uh, patients with moderate uh, obstruction, FPV1 30 to 65%, there is some um, uh, improvement or delay probably in progression of disease. Have they discussed in the paper whether there was also an associated symptomatic improvement or clinical improvement in day-to-day uh, -day life of those patients? No, there, there were not any sort of clinically meaningful outcomes as far as, you know, symptom mortality, anything like that, but, but symptoms particularly as well. That hasn't been recorded. Okay, thank you. It, it's all about, yeah, the FEV1 decline in the observational studies and then the, the CT markers of emphysema in their RCTs. Any other question from the audience? So what I'm going to do now is uh, we're going to go with a poll. Um, and then let's see. I'm, I'm launching right now the poll. Are you able to see it? So go ahead and... Yes. Go ahead and, uh, and, and, and mark your answers uh, with question number one is, which of the following genotypes is most commonly responsible for alpha-1 antitrypsin disease? I think Ma uh, Mike mentioned that very well. So let's go one by one first. And, um, Can you guys still see my screen or do I need to stop sharing it? No, that, uh, we still see your screen, but I, I, can, I can share it on the screen, don't worry. Okay. Are you guys able to see the, the results of the poll or not yet? Uh, we have to answer all three questions, right? Yes, exactly. Uh, I should have done it in a different way. Sorry, this is my first time doing this. I'll yeah, so the second question is, according to the ATS ERS guidelines, all of the following patients should be tested for alpha-1 antitrypsin. Uh, uh, patient number one is a 42-year-old male with asthma, exceptional dyspnea, and complete reversibility of obstruction on PFTs. Six, or patient number two is 64, male with COPD, resting dyspnea, and fixed obstruction on PFTs, 35-year-old uh, female with unexplained liver disease and no respiratory symptoms, 48-year-old female with necrotizing paniculitis and asymptomatic emphysema, so let's see, and then the, the question number three is, which of the following patients with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency would, like benef would likely benefit the most from augmentation therapy? Um, a 48 year old male with COPD and FEV1 of 15%, 53 year old female with who is uh, three months uh, status post bilateral lung transplant, 45 year old female with cirrhosis and asymptomatic emphysema, or 42 year old male with COPD and FEV1 of 40%. Anybody else wants to vote? Uh, I think Dr. Tatum has an, a question. Go ahead, Dr. Tatum. Um, one of the questions that I had was, 
in relationship to discontinuing um, augmentation therapy if there is no sort of objective benefit for the patient. Um, one of the things that I've observed is that the pharmaceutical company is very hesitant um, to have it discontinued precisely because it um, is so costly and such a high revenue generator for them. Um, and I was wondering if there are any, any other people who have observed this or any other observations around this. I, I have not um, I have not experienced that I, I, I really I've, I've never I haven't had an experience with augmentation therapy in patients I don't know if anybody else in the audience or if you have any comment Mike no I wasn't aware of that um, that point that the insurance companies may be hesitant to, to discontinue it. Uh, I, I can imagine why it's such a great revenue generator. I was looking at, you know, the cost of the medication is actually fairly cheap, but it costs the patient and insurance a hundred thousand a year. So um, I guess that's not surprising, but I was not aware of that. One thing that I should point out about discontinuation in general, and I, I wonder how it works in that context, Dr. Tatum, but patients who receive transplant do not get augmentation therapy afterwards. That, that's just another thing to point out as well, because they're, you know, even though they're alpha-1 antitrypsin deficient, that should not cause any um, infringement on their lungs for a good, you know, 30 to 40 years. So that was another point that, that I meant to bring up in the talk. I see. So, yeah. Um, I wonder how insurance works with that after getting transplant. I don't know if that's uh, an issue at all or something that needs to be considered. Yeah, yeah you're right. That's, that's a problem. So let me, um, the, let me share the results of the poll right now. Everybody's going to be able to see it. Can you see it there? Yes. Okay. So uh, to the first question is which, uh, which of the following genotypes is most commonly responsible for alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency or disease? Uh, most answer PIZZ. So Mike, you wanna comment on that? Yeah, so the PIZZ genotype is responsible for pretty well almost all um, patients with alpha-1 antitrypsin disease. The, the MZ would be a carrier state and probably no risk uh, of, of emphysema compared to the usual population. And then the null genotype, these patients will almost always develop emphysema at a young age. They have no protein whatsoever, um, but this is not very common. So yeah, ZZ is the correct answer. Okay, so most, most uh, answer correctly. Question number two was a little bit uh, harder. Seems like uh, we have shared opinions. So according to ATS ERS guidelines, all of the following patients should be tested for alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, except. So what is, what is the correct answer there, Mike? So the correct answer is, is number one, the 42-year-old male with completely reversible asthma based on PFTs because of that complete reversibility. The, um, the second patient would meet criteria because they have COPD, they're symptomatic, and they have a fixed obstruction. And then some other people chose uh, answer D, though they actually, there is a level A recommendation for any patient with necrotizing paniculitis because of the association with alpha-1 and because of the success of augmentation therapy for treating that skin condition. What about patient number three there? With the patient number disease? three also, also meets criteria for that because of, of the unexplained liver disease. And this would be a, a standard part of a, um, of a liver evaluation. Okay. I see. So patient number one, so pretty much the description there in patient number one is, is it's a patient with asthma, with dyspnea, but uh, PFTs are completely reversible. So yeah. it's just like any other asthmatic that we have, so that wouldn't need to be tested in general. Um, and question number three, um, so which of the following patients with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency would likely benefit the most from augmentation therapy. So most uh, uh, most uh, people in the audience uh, responded as the, as the last case. So Mike, 
Yep, so answer D was correct, which which the overwhelming majority got because he, he has COPD and he's in that moderate obstruction range, which is where the benefit in observational studies has been shown. Um, answer A, the 48-year-old with an FEV1 of 15% is probably unlikely to benefit. He's, he's too sick based on his PFTs and based on the, the observational data. Answer B is a patient who's already received lung transplant. And as I just mentioned now that um, they're unlike, they usually don't continue it and it's unlikely to be of any benefit. And then the patient with, with really asymptomatic emphysema would not benefit from an emphysema standpoint and giving alpha-1 protein does not have any uh, impact on cirrhosis because it's due to that almost collateral damage from the alpha-1 protein being misfolded in the liver. I see. Good. Perfect. So is there any other question from the audience? That was great. Okay. So if you give us uh, uh, two minutes, let me get everything ready for, for our next uh, presenter. Thank you very much, Mike. That was a, that was a great presentation and, and the questions too. Thanks, Dr. Diaz. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Hello, uh, Wing. Perfect. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, I can hear you. Can you uh, get closer to the microphone? Sure. How's that? Perfect. Better. Are you ready? Yep. Okay. So, continuing with the lectures today, uh, we have uh, Dr. Wing Kong. He's uh, he's going to talk to us about a journal club in relationship with the. Um, uh, the, the topic, which is alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency in, in patients with COPD. This was, this was a very interesting study done in Spain, and, and, and probably is going to emphasize what uh, Mike has already told us in the lecture. There's, there will be also a, a question at the end, uh, Paul, to see how, how, how much you guys understood about this. Thank you very much, Wing. Go ahead. Again, uh, thank you, Mike, for uh, his uh, great and very informative uh, lecture. Uh, and hello, everyone. Uh, I'm going to follow up uh, Mike's lecture uh, with the Journal Cup article, uh, testing for alpha-1 antitrypsin in COPD in outpatient respiratory clinics in Spain. It's a multi-level cross-sectional analysis of the EPO console study. And uh, this uh, paper is published in 2018. Um, trying to move forward the slide. Okay. All right. Uh, so just a quick overview of the anti-1 alpha trypsin deficiency. Um, Mike kind of gone through some of this already. It's a disease that is characterized by impaired defective uh, production of alpha-1 antitrypsin protein in the liver, and it's associated with increased risk of developing emphysema and liver disease. A uh, quick um, pathophysiology of uh, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency uh, is, is uh, caused by a misfolded uh, alpha-1 antitrypsin polymers that accumulates in the liver, uh, causing proteotoxic cells and liver disease, and this causing uh, excessive uh, neutrophil uh, elastase that uh, induces more uh, mucin productions and other protease and inflammatory cytokines. 
Uh, and here you can see like a sub, uh, sub picture over here showing how alpha-1 antitrypsin is just not an uh, anti-protease, but also like a potent anti-inflammatory agent. It interacts with uh, multiple factors like the interleukins 8, leukotrienes uh, B4, and tumor necrosis factor alpha to regulate uh, a lot of other interactions uh, down the road. Therefore, a deficiency of uh, alpha-1 antitrypsins um, can cause uh, an up unopposed uh, damage uh, to tissues and emphysema. So uh, this is the table just showing uh, overview of uh, different clinical conditions associated with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Uh, it is associated with uh, anchor associated vasculitis, gallstone, emphysema that we already talked about, uh, and a lot of liver disease as well. Another picture that's showing just a possible pathway uh, for treat, uh, for a possible strategy to treat uh, alpha-1 antitrypsin. Um, you can go by reducing the production of the mutant protein with uh, some uh, small interfacing in RNA and correcting the genetic defect with genes or cell therapy. Can think about using chaperon uh, within the endoplasmic reticulum to promote foldings or degradations of the misfolded protein, uh, blocking the formation of polymers by stabilizing the intermediate uh, in the folding pathway of the monomers. Or you can also do stimulating the autophagy pathway to clear the from the polymers. Going back to the journal article, so this study is conducted because the diagnosis of alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency is much lower than expected according to epidemiology studies in Spain. It is estimated that up to 2% of cases of COPD are associated with alpha-1 antitrypsins. So in Spain, it is expected to have about 14,500 uh, of individuals with severe homozygous PICZ phenotype deficiency. However, only about 350 have been identified in their registry. Despite multiple healthcare institutes, including the WHO, the Spanish National Guidelines for COPD, and the ATS and ERS recommendation for testing for alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency for at least once during the lifetime, most of the patients are not tested. So, so uh, this study is done to try to investigate the frequency and determinants of testing serum alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency in COPD patients in Spain. So there's quite a few of objective in the in this study. Uh, number one, is to investigate the frequency of alpha-1 antitrypsin level testing in COPD patients at outpatient respiratory clinic in Spain. Second, to describe the factors associated with alpha-1 antitrypsin testing. Third, determine the frequency of serum level below the reference values of alpha-1 antitrypsin in COPD patients treated at the clinic. And finally, to describe the clinical characteristics and data on referral for diagnostic procedure carried out for COPD evaluation. As for the study questions, the population being investigated in this study is the CO patient with COPD evaluated in outpatient respiratory clinic in Spain. The exposure that is assessed is alpha-1 antitrypsis testing. And the outcome that they measure is the frequency and determinants of alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency testing, the factors associated with uh, the testing. Going to study design, the study is obtained, uh, the study, this study obtained is data from the EPO console study, which is a clinical audit for a uh, national Spanish guideline for COPD. Uh, it is an observation cross-sessional study with prospective case recruitment in outpatient respiratory clinic uh, in a period of 12 months, from May 2014 to May 2015. The sample population was selected from patient that is seen for consultation in the hospital that is participating uh, for this study during this recruitment period. And the recruitment for the patient was intermittent uh, for this 12 months, 
and they are recruited prospectively during the year every two months. So every two months, each investigator will recruit the first 10 patients that they diagnose with COPD and seen in this respiratory clinic. And there was an official invitation to participate in a study from the Spanish Society of Pneumology and Thoracic Surgery to all the respiratory units in Spain. The inclusion criteria of the studies are patients that are aged 14 years or older, who are smokers or ex-smokers of at least 10 pack per year, with COPD diagnosis on the basis of spirometric tests, which is the FEB1 over FVC ratio post bronchodilator less than 0 0.7, or the FEB1 to FVC ratio P bronchodilation less than 0 0.7, and FEB1 less than or equal to 80%. If there's no bronchodilation reversibility testing available. The exclusion criteria were no previous follow-up for at least one year in a respiratory outpatient clinic. And patients that are currently participating in clinical trials or research projects related to COPD. The information gathered was historic in nature as for the clinical data uh, of the last and the previous consultation, where the information about the hospital resources was concurrent. This is a table that showed uh, that from the 175 public hospital in the national health system in wider in Spain, uh, 59 of them participated, which account for 33.3% of uh, the total uh, uh, Spain population that is supposedly to be allocated uh, for these hospitals. And the catchment uh, population that's mentioned over here um, as, was actually estimated for each of the autonomous uh, community of Spain. Initially, it's kind of like the the autonomous community is kind of like the division of like states in the Spain in uh, in in Spain, and uh, this data is uh, obtained according to the population uh, census data in Spain. And this is a table that's showing uh, the characteristic of the participating hospital, and the resources uh, of the respiratory units. Note that most of the hospital that's participating. Uh, a public university hospital with a, largest in, a larger in, inpatient respiratory clinic available. And they also have uh, more numbers of inpatient respiratory bed and a higher number of uh, pulmonary staff members available. Also, they have uh, also, uh, quite sufficient uh, resources testing. Uh, almost all of, uh, all of them have uh, PFD labs. Um, they test, uh, all of them have ability to test for spiral uh, diffusion capacity, uh, total lung capacity. Most of them uh, have resources to retest for a respiratory muscle shrink, and most of them have six minute walk text available. And a lot of them also do have uh, capability to perform CPACs, uh, have a pulmonary rehab program, and most of them are a hospital based pulmonary program as well. And, and also, but also note that there's only two dot of them have alpha 1 anti trypsin genetic testing available. And this study further divided uh, the hospital that we mentioned into a small center and large center uh, for comparison. To be considered a large center, uh, the number of beds of the center has to be more than 500. And there has to be more than 20 inpatient respiratory beds, more than five pulmonary staff, and more than 10,000 annual outpatient respiratory visits. And the center must be met all of this above criteria to be considered a large center. Note that in all larger hospital and public university hospital, they, uh, the difference between them is uh, also including the numbers of beds per center, the number of pulmonary staff member, the number of respiratory residents, and the annual outpatient respiratory risks and the availability of a six minute walk, walk, walk test. For statistical analysis, 
The quantitative variables are measured by uh, frequency distribution, while the quantitative variables uh, are recorded by their mean, uh, sorry, by their median intercultural range uh, and minimum maximum. And the association between each independent variables and dependent variable are first assessed by a crude uh, odd ratio with a logistic regression model. And they also add in a random effect model to account for the correlation between individual that is within the same hospital. And anything that shows a six signals with a p-value less than 0 0.10 were accepted for inclusion. And then another multivariate analysis was performed it to look for the independent effects of the selected uh, variables. And with this multivariable uh, logistic regression model, the statistical significance was assumed that, uh, as p less than 0 0.05. And these are the results of the studies. So this EPO console uh, studies uh, revealed 17,893 clinical records. And out of them, uh, about 70,000 records, there's 5,727 patients that were presumably diagnosed with COPD. And out of them, 73 are excluded for participating in clinical, another clinical trial. 61 is excluded uh, for missing tobacco use history. 360 is excluded for lack of follow-up for at least uh, past one year and 694 are excluded for failing to meet spirometric data. Then it resulted in 4,508 patients that are eligible for this uh, audit, and another 100 patients are then excluded for lack of availability of the alpha-1 antitrypsin blood level determinant. So that ends up with 4,408 patients in this uh, retrospective uh, study for alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. And out of this 4,408 patients, only 22.1% of them have alpha-1 antitrypsin level tested in blood. And this is a table showing the characteristics of COPD patient tested for alpha-1 antitrypsin and the diagnostic procedure conducted during the follow-up according to the presence or absence of alpha-1 antitrypsin. Note that they define the alpha-1 antitrypsin level as normal if they have more, uh, if the ATT level is more than uh, 100 milligram per deciliter, 50 to 100 as intermittent deficiency, and less than or equal to 50 as severe deficiency. This is a bit different from the general cutoff that we use. As uh, Mike has mentioned, we use um, alpha-1 antitrypsin level of less than 57 milligram per deciliter uh, to determine if the patient uh, needs augmentation therapy. Also, if they meet the rest of the augmentation uh, treatment criteria, uh, which is a level of smoker, uh, age more than 18 or uh, older, uh, with an alpha-1 antitrypsin genetic uh, variant consistent with severe uh, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency and evidence of airflow limitation. And it is also noted that uh, from this study, out of the 114 patients that has alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, 26 of them have serum level less than or equal to 50 milligram per deciliter. So about 22.8% of them has severe deficiency that might need treatment depending on if they meet the rest of the criteria. Next, these are the hospital uh, characteristic that is um, showing that uh, patients that who are tested are more likely to be followed in hospital with a large number of outpatient respiratory visits or in hospital that has a specialized COPD clinic available. And this table is showing that uh, the results of the univariate analysis. This shows the association of patients tested and not tested for COPD and what are and their dependent factors. 
there are many positive uh, signals for factors that I highlighted with, uh, with red and everything with p-value less than 0 0.1 is included in the next uh, multivariate analysis. And then this including gender, age, uh, smoking pack, year history, uh, someone who are active smoker, what's the BMI, the Charleston index, what are the level of dyspnea, uh, what are the phenotype of the COPD, are they have uh, like chronic bronchitis, do they have history of asthma, do they have uh, emphysema, and their uh, FEV1 uh, severity, and if uh, what are the treatments that they are on, and where are they followed up on. And according to this uh, multivariate analysis, the independent factors that's associated with increased alpha-1 antitrypsin testing that I highlighted in red included patients with ages less than or equal to 55, the BMI less than or equal to 21, history of symptoms of asthma, or being treated at a specialized COPD outpatient clinic. And there's also factors that are associated with frequent, uh, like less frequently uh, tested uh, alpha-1 antitrypsin value that I highlighted in blue. They are Charleston index that's more than equal to three, being male, or having a chronic bronchitis uh, criteria. So a uh, summary of the findings of this study. So only 22.5 of patients who has COPD diagnosis follow up in outpatient respiratory clinic in Spain have ever had their alpha-1 antitrypsin value measured. However, it is estimated that there should be 14,500 people in Spain that have uh, PICC phenotype and 175,000 with uh, PISCZ phenotype, but only 348 patients uh, with CZ phenotype was registered. And there's only 100 patients with uh, PISC phenotype was found in the Spain registry. So alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency is very under-recognized and under-tested in Spain. And this study is also provided data about the frequency of alpha-1 antitrypsin testing and what are the factors that's associated with uh, increase or decrease testing. So the patient's level variables seems to be the one that uh, mainly determine uh, about how frequently uh, alpha-1 antitrypsin testing is done. So factors that's associated with alpha antitrypsin again are age, a younger age, um, a lower BMI, history of symptoms of asthma, or being treated as specialized COPD outpatient clinics. While the Charleston index more or equal to three being male or chronic bronchitis criteria is negatively associated with alpha one antitrypsin testing. And this kind of makes sense because most of uh, it seems like a lot of us go by the typical clinical characteristic of alpha-1 antitrypsin deficient, which are young adults with progressive dyspnea and developing emphysema despite lower tobacco exposure. However, if we just go by this typical clinical characteristic, we might miss a lot of less typical presentation, which is why uh, a lot of society guidelines, including the ATS and e, uh, ERS, are recommending to test for alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency at least once in everyone with diagnosis of COPD. Another interesting fact that we find in studies is also that specialized COPD clinic is associated with increased testing. So there might be some potential benefits for specialized COPD clinics for patients that have a COPD. So going to a study appraisal, so this study actually has quite a few strength. First, it addressed a really clearly focused uh, clinical question, which is how often are alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency tested in the COPD patients that are in Spain? 
And it also uses a Popre research uh, method to it because it's observational, uh, because they just want to test for the frequency, they just use the observation study and going by the clinical audits. And it also clearly describes the method of selection during the, uh, in the method uh, section. And the samples of subjects do represent the population that they are referred to, which is the COPD patient in Spain. And this study sort of carries a really significant statistical power because supposedly it is uh, considering the whole Spain population with the clinical audits according to the population census. And it also has accounted for the confounding factors by using multivariate regression uh, uh, model and also add in that uh, random factors to account for uh, patients that is from the same hospital. However, it does also carry a few limitations. First, um, this study has uh, quite a few of selection bias. The centers that they are selected are not randomly uh, assigned. It. They are chosen uh, from the previous uh, clinical audit and the hospital itself can also agree or refuse to participate in the study. There's also uh, quite a few missing data that is uh, shown from the selection process. And the diagnosis of uh, alpha-1 antitrypsin is solely based on the concentration of, uh, of uh, alpha-1 antitrypsin in the blood. And these numbers can fluctuate depending on temporary deficiency due to liver disease, low protein diet, hormonal imbalance, or, or any like acute phase uh, reactions. More so, um, the study did not talk about itself, but it also did not account for the population with undiagnosed COPD in Spain or patient that did not follow up in the respiratory clinic regularly because they excluded any patient that did not follow up in the, uh, in the respiratory clinic for the past one year. And another issue is more for ourselves is that this study is only uh, conducted in Spain, so the external validity may not be applying to us in the United States and the prevalence might be some, uh, somewhat different uh, from Spain than in the United States. But I mean, but thinking about all that, like my con conclusion of the study is that alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency is still under-recognized. And despite multiple like medical society recommendation to check for alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, the alpha-1 antitrypsin values are still not tested frequently. And I think that we should really be uh, raising awareness of alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency uh, in clinicians. And I think that we should also start to think about testing for alpha-1 antitrypsin in our patient population as well, because I don't think we do it regularly uh, in our practice as well. And this are my reference, and this is what I have for this uh, journal article. Thank you very much, Wing. Uh, that was a really good presentation. Uh, do me a favor, could you please go back on the slides to the one that shows the results of the uh, univariate, uh, I think it's uh, the multivariate analysis, I'm sorry. Uh, this is the multivariate. Yes. So, so uh, as you already mentioned, I think it's important, uh, uh, there are already guidelines by the, by the ATS and the ARS in terms of who should be tested. But I think this gives us a little bit more uh, objective measurements, objective uh, factors uh, to look for um, uh, in people who should be testing. Uh, uh, and of course, these are just a few, but we still have to consider other ones. Uh, like for example, why do you think that the, 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 the specialized COPD clinics uh, was, uh, was a factor for the patients to be tested? Well, I think that because like when they go to a specialized COPD clinic, like first I think that um, the clinical staff over there will be more experienced in actually just treating for COPD and they will try to go with the guideline of actually testing everyone at least once, everyone with COPD at least once for alpha and antitrypsin deficiency. Right, and yeah, and that, that's exactly right. So, so they're looking also for all the secondary causes. So when you have somebody or, or a person or a clinic in general that specializes in, in one 
or have a, a specializes in one disease or in, in, in uh, th then then you start looking in, uh, into that disease a little deeper. Uh, I think that's pretty much the role uh, 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 of arguing why, why sometimes we need these types of clinic. Um, so uh, and also standardizes not only the the the, the testing but also the, the management of certain conditions. Uh, I don't know if you have if anybody in the audience would like to uh, uh, give an opinion about this. Um, uh, you know the, the the role of a specialized clinics in general, uh, not necessarily in COPD, but now one more thing it would be uh, also the the role of probably protocols uh, that are very well established uh, um, uh, in general. If if there is no such a thing as an as a specialized clinic, so the role of a protocol written and that's something for the fellows too. Uh, keep that in mind when you do things protocolized in a protocolized way you tend to miss less uh, less uh, less things uh, less conditions less diseases etc uh, and every, and you kind of ensure that everybody does it in the same way at least in the place where you work so the, that's important uh, also uh, to mention um uh, i can see why uh, patients who've had copd as well as history of asthma at the same time may have been tested and as as you show there uh, and the uh, analysis and the regression analysis uh, being uh, one of the factors for testing. Um, I don't know exactly uh, why the BMI was, uh, do you have any explanation for the BMI in general? That I actually don't, but I'm thinking about that it might be related to uh, comorbid uh, comorbidity. Like if someone with like a higher Charleston score or maybe a higher BMI, like we may tend to think that this patient has other reason to contributing to the dyspnea uh, compared to someone that who have no other medical condition and is younger and is more fit and then they have been carrying out like significant dyspnea. Then we start to try to think about, oh, is there something else going on? This is kind of my line of thoughts. I think that's yeah that that makes sense that makes sense in total and then I agree with uh, with the age uh, as you mentioned even though uh, age less than 55 was a factor to test uh, I, I think uh, uh, age is not necessarily a factor that we should be looking into when it comes to testing I think we should test more but this is the probably the reason why they they probably have been missing a lot of uh, um, the other a uh, um, uh, um, Patients with a condition in this uh, in this big uh, in those all, in all those big centers or medical centers in Spain. Um, uh, you also mentioned about the the levels that they use, right? Uh, that was actually it was it was called if it was less than a hundred, and and just by the previous lecture, but we already mentioned, you know, the 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 limit that we're looking for is uh, is much less than that. Right. So less than 100 is considered increased risk of developing disease for uh, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, but less than 57 will be associated with a much higher risk in developing some form of diseases. So that's why our, I think our general cutoff in the United States is less than 57 uh, with symptoms and with uh, like FEV racial abnormalities. And if they quit smoking, then we can consider them for uh, therapy. Right. Another thing that I want to mention is that even if the patient that we test for is not a candidate for augmentation therapy, they also carry out some potential benefit for the patients, like the risk modification that uh, Mike already talked about, like uh, smoking cessation, try to avoid any uh, high risk uh, occupation, but also to uh, tell them about identifying like, the at-risk family uh, members and we can do gen a genetic counseling. Um, so those are some benefits that we might not be thinking about while we're seeing that patient. Right, yeah, very interesting. Um, um, you actually, you guys made me read a little bit about this more. You know, we don't get to see this very often and definitely not in my case um, uh, because of uh, bronchoscopy, but in general, uh, I think these are very, very interest, interesting points that uh, Mike and you uh, have brought up today. Is there any other question from the audience? 
Everybody can speak, by the way. So go ahead and unmute yourself if you want to. Well, okay. So uh, what we're gonna do now is I'm gonna, I'm gonna launch another uh, poll uh, for everybody. So um, please uh, answer. Uh, uh, the poll is right there in front of you. So please vote with, uh, with your question. Uh, which of the following is not a factor that increased frequency of uh, alpha-1 antitrypsin uh, testing in, in, in the study, in this hippocampal study? Male gender, age less than 55, BMI less than 21, or history of symptoms of asthma. So some people are voting there. Come on guys, there are 19 of you. It's only eight who have responded. This is anonymous by the way, nobody knows who is responding what. We just wanna know whether um, it was understood from the, from the journal club. You kind of have the answer right behind too. Exactly. Don't say that. <laughs> Wing. <laughs> Everybody, nine have responded, please. Everybody, please respond. That's 10. Okay, we're gonna stop right there. So we're gonna end the polling and here goes. Can you, can you see the results? When can you see it? Yes, I can. Okay, so for the, so uh, a very um, uh, divided uh, opinions in terms of this, which of the following is not a factor that increased frequency of testing in, in this study. So go ahead, Wing. What is the answer? So uh, the answer is uh, A, male gender. Male gender, okay. So can you go over the, the answers? And Yeah, so according to this multivariate uh, analysis that's right behind, so uh, the odd ratios associated with uh, male gender is 0 0.55. So when we're looking at odd ratio, anything that's less than one is considered to be uh, negatively uh, associated. So anything that's more than one is uh, considered to be positively associated, which is age less than 70, uh, 55, uh, medical history of asthma, symptoms suggestive of asthma, or BMI less than 21, all of them has the odd ratios more than one. So all of these are actually associated with increased testing of alpha-1 antitrypsin values in blood. While the only one that is negatively associated in a, in a multiple choice is the male gender. Good, yeah. So male gender, pretty much, uh, it's it's it's, uh, it's uh, negatively associated with testing. So meaning that if they had a, if they were male, they pretty much didn't test on those patients. So okay. So anything else, Wing, you would like to add on? Oh, that's it. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Wing. That was uh, that was really good for everybody. Thank you very much for participating today. Uh, we're finishing kind of earlier. Uh, there is going to be a survey that will be sent to you um, either at the end of this um, um, lecture or to your emails. Please make sure to respond. This is regarding the lectures, trying to see uh, how this is going to happen in the future and what we can learn from this. Seems like we're going to have to carry these lectures uh, in, a, in a video uh, uh, sort of like a, a way. Um, uh, and, and I don't know when we will resume again the in-person lectures as we had in the past, but uh, just to try to get as much as we can from all these interactions that we have, I think it's important uh, for us to have some information. 
Um, so please, uh, please answer to the uh, to the survey and then send it back. I appreciate that. If there is nothing else to say, so thank you very much for joining today, and uh, we'll be sending information for the lectures for next Friday. Hope everybody's okay. Seems like uh, the weekend is going to be nice, at least tomorrow. Let's see. Um, hopefully, we we'll have a better weather than we have had for the last couple of days. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Bye. Thank you.